want to introduce Robert Haddad formally. Um, Robert Haddad has completed his law studies at Sydney University, and he's also completed a graduate certificate in RE Education at Charles Sturt and a graduate diploma at ACU. He has also completed a master's in philosophy at ACU and a master's in theology and a master's in uh, religious education at the University of Notre Dame. He's the author of several books. Uh, these are just some here. Answering the Anti-Catholic Challenge. Uh, this is a response to Ray Galea, who's an uh, Anglican minister, I believe, uh, in Sydney. He's your next door neighbour, isn't he? Uh, well, he lives down the road. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Case for Christianity. So arguments from St. Augustine the Martyr. And, uh, oh, sorry, not St. Augustine, St. Uh, Justin Martyr. And Defend the Faith. This is a great book, actually. With, uh, it's an apologetics book. And just covers a lot of the key Catholic doctrines, um, going into the Church's history, the Church Fathers, and Scripture. Uh, and he, at the moment, he is the head of the new evangelization at, uh, in the Sydney Archdiocese. So, uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming uh, Robert Haddad. Thank you, Michael. I was very excited when I looked at the... I haven't read the new encyclical from Pope Francis uh, yet, but I read extracts from it, and I was very excited to see that, uh, well, Pope Benedict and Pope Francis as co-authors have quoted St. Justin, one of my favourite saints, a number of times. Um, and St. Justin, uh, Michael just mentioned the book there. I did a study of St. Justin for my thesis, looked at his arguments in defence of Christianity, that he put forward to the Roman emperors, the co-emperors at the time, Antoninus Pius and his adopted sons, Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus and the Roman Senate. And I, had an, I made an analysis of his arguments, 12 of them that I extracted from his writings. It was a torturous work to do, but uh, I, 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 I've always had a liking for the, the apologist, the person who defends or gives a reasoned explanation for his or her beliefs. And that's what I'm doing today. And the subcategory I'm, I'm engaged in here is Catholic apologetics. There's natural apologetics where you're trying to establish that God does exist. There is a God. And you know who that audience is. You're targeting the atheist or the agnostic, for example. When I mean targeting, I don't mean you're targeting them, pointing the finger at them. You're addressing them. And then you have Christian apologetics, where you, this is intertheistic discussion or debate, where you're trying to establish what we've just had, your previous talk, that God is a trinity and Christ is divine. And you might be talking to other people who believe in God, but they don't necessarily believe in the trinity or the divinity of Christ. And then we have Catholic apologetics, where we're looking, where this is discussion, dialogue, debate between um, Christians um, who don't share the same beliefs. And here we're defending particular Catholic distinctives. Uh, and giving a reasoned explanation for them. Today I've been asked to look at two pillars of classical Protestantism and to critique them from a Catholic perspective and in the process show why the Catholic position really is the fullness of the truth from the point of view of scripture, church fathers uh, and his historical development as well. Um, it's 2013 and in four years from now we're going to have the 500th anniversary celebrating, well many will be celebrating the Protestant, Re the beginning of the Protestant Reformation which has a formal date of October 31, 1517. There's going to be millions of people around the world who's going to see, celebrate that as a great moment in history, world history and church history. There'll be others who lament at it and so we need to be prepared for that event. Uh, and be aware of what are some of the issues. And the two critical issues, among many, are these two that I'm going to touch on today. Who knows what sola scriptura means? Scriptura Yeah. All we need is an, our authority to guide us in everything by way of faith and morals, and what is necessary for our salvation is found in the Bible and the Bible alone. And who knows what sola fide means? Faith. Faith alone. And what do we mean by faith alone? What's the whole point of advocating faith alone? No no works, salvation, salvation uh, justification, being just in the eyes of God and hence uh, saved uh, is through simply faith alone. Nothing else is needed on top of that. Let's have a look at those two today. Feel free to uh, 
stop me at any time. Feel free to ask questions at any time. Uh, I'm not going to actually stop and have a formal Q&A session. So I invite you now at any moment to give me a question or a comment. And please don't hesitate to do that even though I talk so much and I talk so fast and I talk so loud and I move up and down. Just ignore all that and just be happy to uh, engage at any time. Now, am I okay to walk up and down for the camera or am I driving you crazy? Okay, great. Okay. All right. Well, let's look at some basics first. Uh, what am I doing first? Solar scripture, is that right? Yeah. Is that solar scripture? Okay, so I picked up the wrong talk, but that's all right. <laughs> We're going to do both of them today anyway. Now, I know I've been given the deadly hour, which is right after lunch, and that most of you are tending to fall asleep, even though you don't want to. So my task, I'll measure my success on whether I keep you awake or not. All right, now, if the talk's not keeping you awake, I might kick you on the ankle. That might work, and don't be offended if I do that, all right? So what do we mean by solar scriptura? This is, um, this is taken from uh, Evangelical Anglican uh, material, what I'm about to outline now. All, this is what they define, this is how they outline what they mean by sola scriptura. It's always good to critique, it's always good to engage in apologetics. I mean, it's essential to engage in apologetics honestly. We don't want to, no one wants to engage in what we call straw man apologetics, where we're, atta we're attacking not a real life figure, but a caricature of someone else's beliefs. And no one wants to do that. Sometimes, though, it does happen. And it happens with Catholicism a lot. Many times I read critiques of Catholicism, which is critiquing something, but it's certainly not Catholicism because there's a misrepresentation of the Catholic position or a misunderstanding of the Catholic position. And I'm not saying that happens deliberately. I'm just saying it happens. Whatever the motives are, we'll leave it between God and them as to why it happens, but it happens. So I certainly don't want to fall into the same mistake of critiquing someone by firstly misrepresenting what they stand for. So what I'm giving you is their own explanation of what Sola Scriptura is. This is 10 points. One, all Scripture is God-breathed and therefore is inerrant and authoritative. True. I don't have a problem with that. Neither should any Catholic. Two, scripture is sufficient for determining every doctrine important for Christian living. That's what we're going to debate. Is scripture sufficient? And we're going to make a distinction between material and formal sufficiency. I would half agree with that. I would say that scripture is materially, is materially sufficient, but not formally sufficient. And my thesis today is to present the case for formal sufficiency that, that scripture is materially sufficient, but not formally sufficient. And we'll explain what that means later on. The Christian faith, point three, was once and for all entrusted to the saints. That's quoting the epistle of Jude by Christ to the apostles. I agree with that. But that should not be interpreted to mean to exclude oral traditions, which were part of that once and for all delivery, to exclude a living teaching authority, and to exclude the legitimate development of doctrine as well. For Christ and his apostles taught infallibly and authoritatively, I agree, no problem. Five, the apostles used both written and oral forms of teaching and their oral teaching was just as authoritative as their written teaching. Surprise, surprise, I agree. I'm surprised because they would admit that, but it's true and I agree with that. Six, every teaching of Christ and the apostles that was necessary for the ongoing life of the church ended up being written down in the New Testament scriptures. I don't agree with that. And that's one of the principal battlefields together with point two. So point two and point six we need to discuss, we need to debate. And we have point seven, the generations of leaders after the apostles do not share their infallibility or authority. Partly right, partly not right. This is where we have to look at the fact that there is a living teaching authority, what we call the magisterium, that our successors to St. Peter and the Apostles and do have, in limited circumstances, but they do have an infallibility. Not to the, in the same way as the Apostles did, but there is an infallibility that applies to the living teaching church in certain circumstances, particularly when they're focused on teaching faith and morals. Eight, Protestants do not claim to interpret Scripture infallibly, either individually or as a community, 
but through prayer and hard work, it is possible to get most things right. That's their own words, to get most things right. Now, they're making that admission. That's an honest admission and it's a common sense admission. I certainly am in the same position. I don't claim to interpret Scripture infallibly. But my argument is that there is a living teaching authority that can. Nine, those areas in which Protestants are mistaken and are not central to the Christian faith. We'll have a look at that. And we will actually give examples of what they call areas that they call not central, which I would insist are not necessarily central, but essential. Okay? What's central? Who's central? God, the Trinity, Christ. That's central. But other things might not be central, but my argument is that they are essential nevertheless. Sacraments, for example. All right? Ten, what we have of the oral teaching of the apostles is not reliable and therefore it is safer to stick to the trustworthy scriptures. We'll look, about, look at that later too. Not reliable. The old Chinese whispers. Tradition, debunk it, throw it out. It's untrustworthy. It's just Chinese whispers because it's not written down. Written, writing it down like the scriptures guarant has guaranteed the, the authentic transmission, accurate transmission. So anything that's left in the realm of oral transmission is unreliable because it's Chinese whispers. It must get distorted somewhere along the chain. Okay, let's debate that as well. What are the scriptures? Who knows off the top of your head any scriptures that might be used or have been used to support sola scriptura? I mean, if you're going to believe in sola scriptura, let's be frank here, let's be honest, let's be consistent, let's be logical. If you're a believer in sola scriptura, where must you find that this doctrine has been revealed? In the Bible. If you believe in the Bible alone and you'll only believe something if it's in the Bible, then sola scriptura as a doctrine as a pillar of your faith, must be found in Scripture. So where are you going to look to? You're going to look to the Scriptures. So what are some Scriptures you might be aware of that would be ten, that have been used to support Sola Scriptura? What, St. Paul saying, by faith alone in Christ to be justified? Oh, that's Sola Fide. Ah. Okay, well, that's, that's the next talk. You're getting ahead of yourself, okay? You're getting ahead of me, actually, but that's all right. Okay. Yeah. No, look, sorry. Look, I, I really find it's great when someone gives an answer. It's great courage. Even if the answer is wrong, it doesn't matter. You should be commended for giving an answer. Yeah. There's two that I hear. Um, one, again, both of them are a little bit shaky. One of them is, I think it's in the uh, Gospel of John, Christ says, My word is truth. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I don't hear it. I got wrong. John here somewhere. Yeah, keep going. Um, and another one, which is possibly from a letter from St. Paul saying that. The scriptures are authoritative and worthy of Timothy. Yeah, you're talking about 2 Timothy 3, 16 there. Now, I'll give you one and a half out of four. That's all right. You're getting there. Okay. There's a gospel quote. There's, a quote from one, there's one quote from the gospel of St. John. That's your half. And you're touching on 2 Timothy 3, 16. I'll give you one out of one for that one. Good. I'm impressed. Very good. All right. I'll read you these quotes with minimal commentary. What I'm going to do, though, I'm going to make you feel like Sola Scripture is in the Bible. And you should be believing in it. That's what I'm going to do in the next five minutes. Okay, here we go. John 20, 31. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The scriptures are written so that for your benefit, so you can believe in Jesus. And when you believe in him, you're safe. So it's all wrapped up there. In fact, the two topics are wrapped up there, isn't it? So all the scripture, these are written so that you can believe in Jesus, sola fide, and you are saved. That's it. It's all wrapped up. I need to go now. I can go an hour and a half early. All right? I don't think I'll be invited back again, but that's all right. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that a man of God, that the man of God may be complete, Equipped for every good work. There's two important words here. Profitable, ophelimos. Complete, artios. They're the Greek words. Sums it all up. The scripture is inspired, it's profitable, and it makes you complete. If scripture makes you complete, you don't need anything else. Right or wrong. That's what's been, that's what's been said. Scripture 
seals it, makes it complete. Nothing else is necessary. Acts 17, 11. These Jews were more receptive than those in Thessalonica. For they welcomed the message very eagerly and examined the scriptures every day to see whether these things were so. So that's the way, these were the Bereans. And what true Christians must be like are the Bereans. So we want the truth about Jesus. Let's just go to the scriptures like the Bereans. Let's not be like the Thessalonians. Or Thessalonians. All right, from Thessalonica. Okay, they're the Catholics. They look at other things besides scripture. That's why they went off track. 1 Corinthians 4, 6. I have applied all this to myself and for Apollo. For your benefit, brethren, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favour of one against another. Not to go beyond what is written. The Catholics go beyond the written word of God. They go beyond what is written. They're going all these oral traditions and artworks and architecture and liturgies and church fathers and things like that. Just going beyond what is, what is written, the scriptures. Paul says it clearly. Don't go beyond what is written. Stick to the written. Stick to the scriptures. Sola Scriptura. There it is, guys. It's all wrapped up. Now, this talk's only 50 minutes, so I can't, don't have time to rebut all this. Do you want me to rebut these arguments? Who's feeling worried at the moment? Feeling worried? Well, you should be. Okay, because I haven't given an answer yet. Very good. I'll give you an answer so you don't leave worried. Let's go back a bit. Okay. All right. If, go back on John 20. But these are written. What are the these? He's talking about his own gospel. So we need to be consistent. John is not preaching sola scriptura. He's preaching just read my gospel. You don't need anything else. Now we don't really believe that, do we? I mean, it's, it's proving too much. John is really saying these are written, meaning not the whole gospel, not the whole Bible, just his own gospel. We don't need everything else. We don't need anything else. If we're going to use, it's inconsistent. You see what I mean? But these are written. What are the these are written? What are the these? Just his gospel. He's not commenting on the others. All right. So it's no I. He's just saying, I wrote this so that you can believe in Jesus. He's not saying you don't need to read anything else beside what I've written. And he's not trying to make a claim that you only need what is written. All scripture is inspired. Now this is actually, as Newman would argue, this is very Catholic to Timothy 3.16. All scripture is inspired, that's Catholic teaching, and is profitable. That's the Ophelimos is profitable. It's correctly translated here. This is RSV. Some translated to mean sufficient. No, 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 no. It's profitable. That's Catholic teaching. To be profitable, though, is not the same as sufficient. If the, word, if the word said sufficient, then it'll be advocating sola scriptura. But it's not. It's profitable. Of course the word of God the written word of God, scripture, is profitable. But what scripture here is Paul talking about when he's writing to Timothy? He's not talking about the New Testament. He's talking about the Old Testament. So if you were to argue that he is claiming just read the scriptures, then you should be consistent with St. Paul and say you just need the Old Testament. But he's not saying that. He's just saying scripture is profitable. That's Catholic teaching. It's inspired and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, the, the scriptures help you to be complete. Of course they do, but that doesn't mean they are all you need to be complete. I'll give you an example from the way I'm dressed. Now, sometimes I wear a black hat because I, like I don't like my look. I don't like being bald, but I'm bald. <laughs> I'm, that's the reality. So sometimes I wear a hat to cover my head, especially when it's cold. Wearing the hat makes me complete in sartorial elegance, <laughs> right? So the hat, putting on my hat or putting on my jacket makes me complete. To come here today, I put on a jacket to make me complete. But I didn't come just in my jacket, did I? I didn't come just in my black hat, did I? No, but of course, the jacket and the black hat make me complete. Like putting on my shoes makes me complete. But I don't come here just wearing the black shoes. Same with the scriptures. The scriptures help me to be complete. But 
together with everything else, together with the apostolic teaching, the oral apostolic teaching that was occurring at the same time St. Paul was writing this. Of course the Jews in Acts 17, sorry, the Thessalonians, sorry, Thessalonians in Acts 17 were searching the scriptures because St. Paul was preaching Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah using what proof texts? That Jesus fulfilled the expected prophecies. In what book? The Old Testament. So what else are they going to refer to? So what the Bereans were doing actually, they were very Catholic, they were looking at the scriptures for what? To verify Paul's oral preaching, the word of God that came to the, the, the Bereans was St. Paul's oral preaching, which, was a, the, the, which contained the gospel tradition that showed how the Old Testament written scriptures were fulfilled. So what the Bereans was, received was not just the written scriptures. They received the oral apostolic teaching the, tr the apostolic tradition which came orally and that was verified with the Old Testament written scriptures. So we see it was really as a combination of both. And in the end, not to go what beyond what is written. 1 Corinthians 4, not to go beyond what is written. Is St. Paul really saying just focus on the Old Testament, sorry, on this written scriptures. No, it's really, even Protestant scholars tell you this figure of speak, this phrase, do not go beyond what is written, is a figure of speech meaning don't go beyond the rules. The rules here are the rules of charity, that none of you may be puffed up in favour of one against another. He's not saying in everything by way of faith and morals and your beliefs, don't go beyond what is written. Don't go beyond the rule of charity. I'll give you in one instant another quote from St Paul which directly contradicts this narrow interpretation of 1 Corinthians 4, 6. If St Paul meant in 1 Corinthians 4, 6, don't listen to anything unless it's been written down, then how could he say the following earlier, quite a few years earlier, to the Thessalonians, in 2 Thessalonians. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter. If you were to look at 1 Corinthians 4, 6 and interpret it to mean just listen to what has been written and don't listen to anything else beyond what is written, then Paul's contradicting himself, what he said earlier to the Thessalonians. So it doesn't mean, it's not a support for sola scriptura. It's just a figure of speech meaning abide by the normal rules of charity. Yes? <coughs> Sorry, I should know that off the top of my head. Just want to make it sh exactly correct. Uh, 2.15. 2 Thessalonians 2. That's the common quote that's always used by Catholics. It's another battleground quote. All right. My thesis today is to establish, is to assert that sola scriptura is, that scripture is from God, but sola scriptura is from man. There's a difference, a very big difference. And that sola scriptura in the limited time, I've only got half an hour left, does not work by itself. It was never intended by God to work by itself. There are three pillars that hold up this stool. One of them is the written scriptures. The other one is the oral apostolic tradition. And the other one is the magisterium. I'm going to show that scripture, rather than standing alone, works in unison with the old apostolic tradition and that the word of God is actually the written scriptures together with the old apostolic tradition simultaneously and that that is placed in the bosom of the church. The church doesn't stand above scripture, the church is subject to scripture and apostolic tradition but the church is also at the same time the interpreter of the word of God and the official teacher, and that the three work together. What's the picture that we should have as Catholics here? When Jesus 
imagine this in your mind. Jesus on Mount Olivet. I've been there. I was there in April. And I wanted to imagine this scene while I was there. He's standing there. There's 120 people around him. He ascends into heaven. A cloud takes him back into heaven. That cloud is the Holy Spirit in the form of a theophany. What has Jesus left behind? Who has Jesus left behind? There's no what. There's no Bibles that Jesus has left behind. There's the Old Testament as it was generally accepted, as it was at that moment. But Jesus didn't hand out copies of the New Testament. What was left was the, the, the gospel once and for all delivered to the saints, that embryonic church of 120. They held the apostolic tradition given to them by Jesus orally. And Jesus had invested in them that apostolic tradition orally. And he also promised them the Holy Spirit to protect them and guide them and teach him in the faithful transmission of that apostolic tradition. That, what Jesus left behind once and for all to the saints at that moment on Mount Olivet was the oral paradosis in Greek, paradosis, the tradition. It was left in the bosom of the church orally. That's what you have to understand. That's the year 30. Some, I can give you a particular date, May 30, or April 30, the year 30, whatever, probably May 30, yeah. I take the view that Jesus was crucified on the 14th of Nisan, which corresponds to the 14th of April. You work out the resurrection 40 days after that. You're looking about the end of May in the year 30. That's what Jesus has left behind. When were the first scriptures written? The most conservative estimates, you look into the letters of St. Paul to the Thessalonians, in the late 40s. The most cons ultra conservative view of the Gospels is that the Gospel of Matthew was written as early as 42, as, as, or most probably in the 50s. Who knows exactly? We don't know. But my point is the church went for decades without. Gospels. Whatever was written first, whatever order they were written in, and whenever they were written in, there was no Gospels. None of the four Gospels were there being regularly, were there having been written and regularly circulated among the faithful for decades. What were they receiving by way of the Word of God? The old apostolic preaching. The preaching of St. Peter and the other apostles, and St. Paul and Barnabas and their successors. In time, the Holy Spirit moves individuals, pillars of the church, within the church. These same apostles and evangelists, St. Mark and St. Luke, inspires them to put some of that original oral paradosis down in writing. So by the end of the first century, we have what we call the New Testament of 27 books. <coughs> But it was never the intention of God, and nowhere is it exhibited in Scripture, that the workings of the Holy Spirit with the church to inspire particular writings, whether they be Gospels or Epistles, whatever, or the Book of Revelation, was that these writings were intended to supplant, to replace the original apostolic tradition, which was delivered orally. No, they were a rendering in part under inspiration of the Holy Spirit of the part of the apostolic tradition. So by the end of the first century, what do we have? We have inspired scriptures in writing, inspired by the Holy Spirit, which, would, which was a rendering of part of the original apostolic tradition. Then we have the remainder of what was not put in writing, uh, uh, Side by side with that written, those written scriptures, the remaining, remainder of the apostolic tradition, two form, the two together form two sides of the same coin of the word of God. And you have it with the church. You have a church with leadership. There are already successors of St. Peter, Linus, Cletus, Clement by the end of the fourth century. And you had successors to the apostles. Uh, to St. Peter in Antioch, you already had Evodius and Ignatius. And in Jerusalem, you had James the Less and Simon. You're already having these su succession to the original 12. You had a living teaching authority 
monarchical, hierarchical. These are not popular words today, but that is the reality. That's how the church was governed by bishops, and they were the guardians of the deposit of faith, which has now had a twofold dimension, written and oral. My point is, is that Sola Scriptura needs to, to for Sola Scriptura to be consistent with its own principles. It's just you and the Bible and the Holy Spirit. There's an inherent denial of a living teaching authority we call the church or the magisterium. Because the Protestant reformers rose up in opposition to that living teaching authority. They were in opposition to the Bishop of Rome and the bishops in communion with him. So they weren't in a position or they, were, they weren't in a willing position to be advocating the legitimacy of the authority that they were opposing. And there was no alternative. And you're denying the successor of St. Peter and the successors to the other apostles their authority. You must be reserving authority to yourself in their place. And so, basically, Sola Scriptura is the assertion of myself, the Holy Spirit working with me to guide me in all truth through the reading of the Gospels, through the reading of Scripture. What I'm going to assert now is that in actual fact, uh, Sola Scriptura falls down from this point of view because there is, and Scripture tells us there is, a living teaching authority established by Christ to whom all the believers in Christ, all the baptized, are meant to listen to, rather than claiming myself to be the authority. What happens when you deny one pope? You don't, you, you, you're not left with no pope. You make everyone else pope. Everyone becomes pope. Everyone becomes their own pope. That's what happens in reality. Even though they will deny, I'm no pope. I don't claim to be infallible. I don't claim to be a teacher to the whole world. You know? But the reality is what you're claiming is that the Holy Spirit teaches you the truth through your own private reading of the Bible. And that's what happens, in effect. And that one ex-student of mine who I taught in high school who became a radical independent Baptist. I challenged him on the phone once and said, are you a teacher for the whole world? You know, if it's just you and the Bible and the Holy Spirit inspiring you to understand what the Bible means, are you a teacher for the whole world? And he said, I am. There's not many who would actually say that. I think he's very immature, to be very honest, to the vast majority of Protestants who are good-willed and honest. Here, but, in some, but that proved my point. In some cases, that's in reality what they become, whether they realise it or not. Matthew 16, Matthew 18, 1 Timothy 3, 15, tell us there's a living teaching authority given to us by Christ. When he says to Peter in Matthew 16, 18 to 19, you know this verse very well. I, and I tell you, you are Peter on this rock, I'll build my church and the powers of death shall not prevail against it. I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And the important words here that I'm trying to emphasize in relation to this point, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And this word of, these words of binding and loosing, they're the ones that reveal that we have a church that is meant to govern, to make laws, to teach. And if it's meant to govern, it's meant to be obeyed. And the same thing we have with Matthew 18. Jesus uses similar words with respect to the other disciples. If he refuses to listen to the church, or sorry, these are, this, yeah, I'll give you the whole verse, 17 and 18. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him to be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So if, if someone is not willing to listen to the church, they are to be ostracized. Anathema means, you know, cut off. So... How could we really justify anyone being cut off unless they are deliberately not listening to an organisation which has authority from Christ? Yes. So which verse was that? That was Matthew 18, 17. And in Matthew 18, 18, you have Jesus using the language again, this time to the, the other disciples besides Peter, of binding and loosing, which we have in the church today. We have... Peter, the successor, Pope Francis today, and the other bishops of the world uniting to, united to him who have this power of binding and loosing. 
the Pope over the universal church, but the bishops over their own local church have the legitimate authority to govern, to bind and loose, that comes from Christ originally given to the disciples, the apostles. In 1 Timothy 3.15, If I am delayed, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and bulwark of the truth. You would think that the Bible is the pillar of truth, the bulwark of truth. The Bible is full of truth. It is our truth when it comes to Christianity. So how could someone call the church as the pillar and bulwark of the truth? Because it's the church is the, is the living teacher, the living authority. Someone explained, I read this once. This is an old, my view is that, how do I interpret 1 Timothy 3.15? Paul says the church is the pillar and bulwark of the truth. So if you want the truth, you go to the church, because the church will teach you what it is, because it's a living teaching authority. Some people argue this. This is a counter-argument I read in the last 12 months. The church is the pillar, bulwark of the truth, but it's not the truth. See the distinction? It's like you look at a pillar, pillars. Pillars are holding up something. What rests above the pillars? The stone, the ceiling, the roof. That's the truth. And what the truth is is the Bible. And the Bible is above the church. And the church is subject to the Bible. And that's how they get around it. It's a cute argument. Okay? But you can't deny that what St. Paul is saying here is that the church is still something of great significance because it's the church of the living God. It's not an organization of men and women only. The pillar and bulwark of the truth. I mean, the, you, it's all together. From the Catholic perspective, the two are together. We're not aiming to put one to the separation of the other. In my original analogy, and I'll come to your question in a minute, the three are working together. We look at the whole building and we don't see just the church, we don't see just the Bible, we don't just see tradition, we see all three working together. So if you want to use this cute argument that the pillars are the church and the truth is the Bible, I would, I would, have, I would fuse them together and i say, look, the church is the teacher of the truth and this is where we go to. Because it's that same church that has the power to bind and loose. Jesus doesn't give the power to bind and loose to the Bible. He gives the power to bind and loose to the church. Jesus doesn't promise the Holy Spirit to the Bible. He promises the Holy Spirit to the church. Sorry, your question. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. My question just was um, as another, uh, another reason as to why you think as to why not the Bible can be above the truth of the church. Could you say that because the church does choose what goes, like what goes in the Bible. Yeah, we're going to come up to that. That's a case point. Now, I know I've only got 16 minutes. So I need to rush a bit, but I want to touch on that point. And that's the, the point is, is that the Bible doesn't form itself. We'll, I'll develop that. Remember I said that, the, that the Jesus promises the Holy Spirit to the church, not to the Bible. So I'll give you an example here. John 14, 16 to 17. Jesus says, I'll pray the Father, and he will give you another counselor. Who's the you? His disciples, his apostles, soon to be apostles. Jesus is promising these men to receive the Holy Spirit, to be with you forever. That is to the end of the world. That is not just to those 12, but to their successors. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So this is why the church is an authority and a living teaching authority that is infallible because it's been promised the Holy Spirit by Christ. And that Holy Spirit has come. It came on Pentecost and it's remained with the church and will remain so until the end of the world. That's not a promise given to a book. It's a promise given to a living teaching authority. And the same thing can be said of John 16:13. In any case, private interpretation of the scripture, there are a couple of verses in scripture it, itself that warn us against 
the folly of individuals thinking and they just grab a Bible, put it in their own hands and they'll be able to interpret it for themselves and for everyone else in the world. If you claim to be able to interpret the Bible for yourself, implicitly you're claiming to be able to interpret it for the whole world. 2 Peter 1.20, St. Peter says, First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own private interpretation. Which means that if you're going to be out there in that village in, in, the, in Palestine or the Holy Land or in Greece or in Rome or wherever, you claim to have a copy of the Gospels and you want to interpret it for yourself, just be careful. It's not for you as that single individual to be a teacher, interpreter and teacher for the whole world. And that's coming from St. Peter, because St. Peter implicitly in this is saying this, that we as the chosen ones of Christ to govern this church, your interpretation has to be subject to our interpretation. And then St. Peter in the same epistle warns about the consequences of wayward private interpretation. There are some things in them hard to understand, these are the letters of St. Paul, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. And that's what has been happening. I'm not pointing the finger of guilt at people, but that's the reality. That's why we have so many contradictions, so, many, so much division within Christianity. We only, we're meant to have one holy Catholic and apostolic church, that's the Catholic Church. We have all these other groups that are founded on what? The Bible, right, but in reality, their own private interpretation of the scripture. And even Luther and Calvin admitted this. I'll give you this quote from, this is what Luther saw happening very early on because of private interpretation of scripture. He wrote this in 1525, his Antwerp sermon. The tiresome devil begins to rage against the un uh, ungodly and to belch forth many wild and mazy beliefs and doctrines. This man will have nothing of baptism. That one denies the sacrament. A third awaits another world between this and the last day. Some teach that Christ is not God. Some say this, some that, and there are many sects and beliefs as there are heads. No peasant is so rude but that if he dreams or fancies something, it must forthuse be the Holy Spirit which inspires him. And he himself must be a prophet. Already, the system has broken down in, within its first decade. Calvin admits this to Luther's successor, Melanchthon, in 1552. It is indeed important that posterity should not know of our differences between Calvinists and Lutherans. For it is indescribably ridiculous that we who are in opposition to the whole world should be at the very beginning of the Reformation at issue among ourselves. And they were, and they have remained so. And the argument is these differences aren't important, but my argument is they are. I'll give you an example now of the issues that are said to be not central and therefore not important in which private in, though the advocates of private interpretation disagree among themselves and can never reconcile and just to show the gravity when people say to you like for example you know the Catholic claim that they're united and the Protestant world is disunited is fallacious because the differences between Protestants is uh, un, is not important we agree on sola scriptura sola fide sola Christi sola gratia Right. We believe in the essentials. What we differ on are things that are not central, not essential. But this is what they disagree on. The Trinity. Not all Bible believers believe that God is a Trinity. Not all Bible believers believe in the divinity of Christ. Not all Protestants have the same position at all on the nature of the Eucharist. Lutherans and Calvinists and Zwinglians and Anglicans all disagreed about the Eucharist from the very beginning. The nature of church government, whether it's meant to be a hierarchical or congregational, infant and adult baptism, baptismal regeneration, the number of sacraments, predestination, the necessity of works or otherwise, women in ministry, the rapture, divorce and remarriage, polygamy, same-sex relationships, masturbation, artificial contraception, in vitro fertilization, abortion, etc., etc., etc. These are all areas of dispute among Bible believers who believe in 
in uh, sola scriptura, who believe in ins personal inspiration by the Holy Spirit, who believe in private interpretation, and they can't agree on these issues, and the claim is then made that these issues aren't central. They might not be essential, I argue many of them are, but they're all essential. And this is the problem. When you break away from the idea uh, or belief in one living teaching authority centralised in the successor to St Peter and the bishops of the world united to him. And that's where we have broken down and we've become a scandal to the world as a consequence. All right, time is moving very rapidly. The divine model of authority is found in Acts 15. There is a dispute. Should Gentile converts who have come to Christ, should they be circumcised? How is it debated? How is it resolved? It was debated first in Antioch after Barnabas and Barnabas and St. Paul arrived back after their first missionary journey. The hardliners who took a view based on scripture, Old Testament scripture, is that you must be circumcised in order to be saved. You must come to Jesus through the law of Moses. Where was the teaching to, to contradict that? I mean, even Jesus was circumcised. And if Jesus was circumcised, his followers must be circumcised. And that's in Scripture. How was that view defeated? It was defeated by tradition. The experiences of Paul and Barnabas out there in Antioch and Pisidia and Asia Minor and Cyprus and what was privately revealed to St. Peter <coughs> when he had the vision of the white sheet unwinding in front of him and he was told by Christ to get up and eat those uh, unclean animals. And he saw the Holy Spirit descend upon Cornelius, the Roman centurion and his family. None of these were recorded in scripture. These were part of the living a tradition of the early church which were put forward as arguments in the Council of Jerusalem as recorded in Acts 15 and those arguments won the day. So yes, there was an appeal to scripture, but there was also an appeal to the apostolic tradition. And it was done in the context of the heavyweights, the St. Peter and the apostles and the other elders and presbyters had come in council and they voted on the issue and they wrote down their decisions in writing. They put it down in writing and it says here, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And then they commissioned that that decision, which was now in writing, be disseminated throughout all the churches. And that was the mission of St. Paul and Silas, his new companion after Barnabas, and he split. That was St. Paul's mission for the rest of his life, to defend the decision of the Council of Jerusalem that said that con Gentile converts to Christ did not need to be circumcised. They only needed to be faith in Christ, and faith meant obedience and therefore baptism, they threw a few other things in there like abstain from fornication and meat that had been strangled. Right? But these were just concessions to the hardliners at that time, temporary concessions. But that's my point. Issues relating to faith and morals, how they, are they to be resolved by private individuals in their own bedroom calling on the Holy Spirit to help them interpret the scripture? No. They are resolved through the formal process of the Holy Spirit working through the church governance, the church leadership, the hierarchy, the magisterium to make a decision after debate, after prayer, after reading scripture, after focusing on tradition. They put that decision down in writing. It's disseminated throughout the churches. We have the same thing today. That's of the divine model. And that's not a sola scriptura model, because that's a model that says that scripture works with tradition under the in interpretation of the magisterium to tell us what we as Christians need to believe in. And the same thing goes with the canon of the Bible. When you open the Bible, you see the contents page. That contents page didn't come with the Bible. That contents page which tells you what books are in the Bible that didn't come with it. That's a product of tradition. And what's that tradition? It's formalized in the Council of Rome in 382 by Pope Damasus, his decision, which was, a, which was taken on board by the Council of Hippo in 393, which was approved by the Council of Carthage in 397, which was then repeated by Pope Innocent I in 405, and then was put down more formally in the Reunion Council of Florence in 1430. 8 for 4035 to 4038 and then was dogmatized by the Council of Trent in, in the 16th century. 
that's all. The Bible, the canon, is impossible to determine simply from Scripture alone. That contents list is either a man-made tradition, because it doesn't come from Scripture, it's an infallible, it's a dis infallible decision of infallible books, or it's an infallible decision about what are the infallible books. And it's the latter, because it is the church as the living teaching authority, the bulwark of truth, the pillar and bulwark of truth, which has told us once and for all definitively <coughs> what are the inspired books. God determines the canon through inspiration. That's remotely, but approximately, it's the church that declares which are the books that have been inspired. And that's the proximate canonization. It's God working through his church to tell us what is the authentic Bible. Then we have a whole series of quotes in support of tradition because basically, Sola Scriptura says, <coughs> just believe in the Bible. Don't believe what's in tradition because tradition's bad. Jesus condemns tradition. It's the traditions of men that contradict the word of God. They are anathema, cast them out. So reading those gospel passages, the presumption is all tradition is bad. Catholic tradition is bad. It contradicts the scriptures. All we need is scripture, hence Sola Scriptura. But there are plenty of verses which talk about tradition in a good sense. I read one to you already, 2 Thessalonians 2.15. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the, to the traditions which you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter. 1 Corinthians 11, 1 to 2. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I have delivered them to you. They weren't delivered in writing. They are delivered by St. Paul's oral preaching. 1 Corinthians 11, 16. If anyone is disposed to be contentious, we recognize no other practice, nor do the churches of God. So if the churches of God are not following this practice, if it's not part of their tradition, we're not going to accept it. Now I'll give you one other one just to cut it short a bit. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus, that you keep away from any brother who is living in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. Where was that tradition? that you receive from Paul, from his preaching, not from the written word of God. The point is that the scriptures, to be consistent, condemn some traditions, but extols other traditions. What traditions are condemned? Those that radically contradict scripture. And those that are extolled are those that are consistent with the apostolic tradition, that are part of what's come from Christ and the apostles. Who to determine what is good tradition, what is bad tradition, what is consistent or inconsistent with scripture? Again, it's the magisterium. Then we've got some quotes here from the church fathers. I've got two for many, many, many which illustrate that the church has always believed in this dichotomy of written scripture, oral tradition, side by side, forming the one deposit of faith. I'll give you one. St. Irenaeus, 180 against heresies, he wrote this, late second century. It, and there's also St. Basil I've got here, and St. Athanasius as well. St. Irenaeus said, if there should be a dispute over some kind of question, Ought we not have recourse to the most ancient churches in which the apostles were familiar and draw from them what is clear and certain in regard to that question? What if the apostles had not in fact left writings to us? Would it not be necessary to follow the order of tradition which was handed down to those to whom they, they entrusted the churches? St. Basil says something similar, a long quote, I won't read it now, but St. Athanasius wrote his synodal letter to the bishops of Africa around the year 370. But the word of the Lord which came through the ecumenical council at Nicaea remains forever. What's he saying there? The magisterium spoke at Nicaea. That is authoritative speaking, authoritative teaching. It's magisterial. It's from God. It endures forever. 
It's not just the Bible, which is materially sufficient, but the Bible alone could not resolve the Arian heresy because the Arian heretics drew from Scripture to support their arguments. And the Orthodox Catholics drew from Scripture to support their arguments. Scripture was materially sufficient, meaning the doctrines were there expressly or implicitly, but we, they needed to be teased down. There needed to be something else, a living teaching authority to reconcile the apparent contradiction between certain scriptures, to reconcile them and to give a formal distilled teaching out of scripture. And that's where scripture can be materially sufficient to provide that material, but not formally sufficient because you need a living teaching authority to work through scripture to give us the final answer. Let's just finish up now. Remember the point that oral traditions, Chinese whispers, and scriptures are reliable? Well, let me tell you something. Even scripture itself, you know, the New Testament, we don't have the originals. Surprise, surprise. The oldest scriptures we have are fra leaves, papyrus fragments from the second century of St. John's Gospel, found in Egypt, Bodmar Codex, John Ryland's manuscript, etc., etc. Altogether we have about 24,000 manuscripts, codices, their books, fragments, leaves, minuscules. When we look at all of them, when the scholars look at all of them together, we see that in all these written copies of the New Testament, there are discrepancies, I'll give you the number, in 6,176 of the 7,948 verses. In other words, 77.7% .7 of the New Testament has come down to us in different manuscripts, codices, fragments, with differences. Only 23, 22.3% of the New Testament has come down in every manuscript, codus, fragment, minuscule that we have in exactly the same way. So if you want to discard old tradition because it's Chinese whispers that's become distorted, you all, you've got to throw out scripture as well. Because it also has come down to us in different forms in 77.7% .7 of verses. Is that a worry to me? Is that a problem to me? No. Because it's the church. The church is the pillar and bulwark of the truth. And the originals were correct. The copies are mistaken. That's human error over centuries. The church is there to distill it for us, to go through and tell us what is the most probable original text and then to interpret it for us. So I don't buy this argument of Chinese whispers because Chinese whispers has, would affect oral tradition and the written tradition. but. We're safeguarded from it because we have a living teaching authority, the magisterium, that oversees both at the same time. Finish up. Sola Scriptura is, is not revealed by God. It is itself a human tradition. One that sadly damages the complete word of God. How? By divorcing the oral and the written word, discarding the oral apostolic word, taking the remaining written word out of the safe interpretive hands of the one divine teaching authority established by Christ. That authority which he promised to sustain to the end of the world. And to repeat my earlier assertion, Scripture certainly is from God, but Sola Scriptura is from man. And we'll leave that for a moment. We'll have a break. Okay.